Chapter 24 The Advocate As Queequeg and I are now fairly embarked in this business of whaling, and as this business of whaling has somehow come to be regarded among landsmen as a rather unpoetical and disreputable pursuit, therefore I am all anxiety to convince you, ye landsmen, of the injustice hereby done to us hunters of whales. In the first place, it may be deemed almost superfluous to establish the fact that among people at large the business of whaling is not accounted on a level with what are called the liberal professions. If a stranger were introduced into any miscellaneous metropolitan society, it would but slightly advance the general opinion of his merits were he presented to the company as a harpooner, say. And if, in emulation of the naval officers, he should append the initials SWF, sperm whale fishery, to his visiting card, such a procedure would be deemed preeminently presuming and ridiculous. Doubtless one leading reason why the world declines honoring us whalemen is this. They think that at best our vocation amounts to a butchering sort of business, and that when actively engaged therein we are surrounded by all manner of defilements. Butchers we are, that is true. But butchers also, and butchers of the bloodiest badge, have been all the martial commanders whom the world invariably delights to honor. And as for the matter of the alleged uncleanliness of our business, you shall soon be initiated into certain facts, hitherto pretty generally unknown, and which, upon the whole, will triumphantly plant the sperm whale ship at least among the cleanliest things of this tidy earth. But even granting the charge in question to be true, what disordered slippery decks of a whale ship are comparable to the unspeakable carrion of those battlefields from which so many soldiers return to drink in all ladies' plaudits? And if the idea of peril so much enhances the popular conceit of the soldier's profession, let me assure you that many a veteran who has freely marched up to a battery would quickly recoil at the apparition of the sperm whale's vast tail, fanning into eddies the air over his head. For what are the comprehensible terrors of man compared with the interlinked terrors and wonders of God? But though the world scouts at us whale hunters, yet does it unwittingly pay us the profoundest homage, yea, an all-abounding adoration. For almost all the tapers, lamps, and candles that burn round the globe burn as before so many shrines to our glory. But look at this matter in other lights. Weigh it in all sorts of scales. See what we whalemen are and have been. Why did the Dutch in De Witt's time have admirals of their whaling fleets? Why did Louis the Sixteenth of France, at his own personal expense, fit out whaling ships from Dunkirk and politely invite to that town some score or two of families from our own island of Nantucket? Why did Britain, between the years 1750 and 1788, pay her whalemen in bounties of upwards of one million pounds? And lastly, how comes it that we whalemen of America now outnumber all the rest of the banded whalemen in the world, sail a navy of upwards of 700 vessels, manned by 18,000 men, yearly consuming four million of dollars, the ship's worth at the time of sailing twenty million dollars, and every year importing into our harbors a well-reaped harvest of seven million dollars. How comes all this if there be not something puissant in whaling? But this is not the half. Look again. I freely assert that the cosmopolite philosopher cannot, for his life, point out one single peaceful influence which, within the last sixty years, has operated more potentially upon the whole broad world, taken in one aggregate, than the high and mighty business of whaling. One way and another, it has begotten events so remarkable in themselves, and so continuously momentous in their sequential issues, that whaling may well be regarded as that Egyptian mother who bore offspring themselves pregnant from her womb. It would be a hopeless, endless task to catalogue all these things. Let a handful suffice. For many years past, the whale ship has been the pioneer in ferreting out the remotest and least known parts of the earth. She has explored seas and archipelagos which had no chart, 
where no Cook or Vancouver had ever sailed. If American and European men of war now peacefully ride in once savage harbors, let them fire salutes to the honor and glory of the whale ship, which originally showed them the way, and first interpreted between them and the savages. They may celebrate as they will the heroes of exploring expeditions, your cooks, your Krusensterns, but I say that scores of anonymous captains have sailed out of Nantucket that were as great and greater than your cook and your Krusenstern. For in their succorless, empty-handedness, they, in the heathenish, sharked waters and by the beaches of unrecorded javelin islands, battled with virgin wonders and terrors that Cook, with all his marines and muskets, would not willingly have dared. All that is made such a flourish of in old South Sea voyages, those things were but the lifetime commonplaces of our heroic Nantucketers. Often adventures which Vancouver dedicates three chapters to, these men accounted unworthy of being set down in the ship's common log. Ah, the world! Ah, oh, the world! Until the whale fishery rounded Cape Horn, no commerce but colonial, scarcely any intercourse but colonial, was carried on between Europe and the long line of the opulent Spanish provinces on the Pacific coast. It was the whalemen who first broke through the jealous policy of the Spanish crown touching those colonies, and, if space permitted, it might be distinctly shown how, from those whalemen, at last eventuated the liberation of Peru, Chile, and Bolivia from the yoke of old Spain, and the establishment of eternal democracy in those parts. That great America on the other side of the sphere, Australia, was given to the enlightened world by the whalemen. After its first blunderborn discovery by a Dutchman, all other ships long shunned those shores as pestiferously barbarous, but the whale ship touched there. The whale ship is the true mother of that now mighty colony. Moreover, in the infancy of the first Australian settlement, the emigrants were several times saved from starvation by the benevolent biscuit of the whale ship luckily dropping an anchor in their waters. The uncounted isles of all Polynesia confess the same truth, and do commercial homage to the whale ship that cleared the way for the missionary and the merchant, and in many cases carried the primitive missionaries to their first destinations. If that double-bolted land, Japan, is ever to become hospitable, it is the whale ship alone to whom the credit will be due, for already she is on the threshold. But if, in the face of all this, you still declare that whaling has no aesthetically noble associations connected with it, then I am ready to shiver fifty lances with you there, and unhorse you with a split helmet every time. The whale has no famous author, and whaling no famous chronicler, you will say. The whale no famous author, and whaling no famous chronicler? Who wrote the first account of our Leviathan? Who but mighty Job? And who composed the first narrative of a whaling voyage? Who but no less a prince than Alfred the Great, who with his own royal pen took down the words from Arthur, the Norwegian whale hunter of those times? And who pronounced our glowing eulogy in Parliament? Who but Edmund Burke? True enough, but then whalemen themselves are poor devils. They have no good blood in their veins. No good blood in their veins. They have something better than royal blood there. The grandmother of Benjamin Franklin was Mary Morrill, afterwards by marriage Mary Folger, one of the old settlers of Nantucket, and the ancestress to a long line of Folgers and Harpeneers, all kith and kin to the noble Benjamin, to this day darting the barbed iron from one side of the world to the other good again, but then all confess that somehow whaling is not respectable. Whaling not respectable? Whaling is imperial. By the old English statutory law, the whale is declared a royal fish. Oh, that's only nominal. The whale himself has never figured in any grand, imposing way. The whale never figured in any grand, imposing way. In one of the mighty triumphs given to a Roman general upon his entering the world's capital, the bones of a whale brought all the way from the Syrian coast were the most conspicuous object in the symboled procession. Footnote. 
See subsequent chapters for something more on this head. End of footnote. Grant it since you cite it, but say what you will, there is no real dignity in whaling. No dignity in whaling! The dignity of our calling the very heavens attest. Cetus is a constellation in the south. No more, drive down your hat in the presence of the Tsar and take it off to Queequeg. No more, I know a man that in his lifetime has taken three hundred and fifty whales. I account that man more honorable than that great captain of antiquity who boasted of taking as many walled towns. And as for me, if by any possibility there be any as yet undiscovered prime thing in me, if I shall ever deserve any real repute in that small but high hushed world which I might not be unreasonably ambitious of, if hereafter I shall do anything that, upon the whole, a man might rather have done than to have left undone, if at my death my executors, or more properly my creditors, find any precious manuscripts in my desk, then here I prospectively ascribe all the honor and the glory to whaling, for a whale ship was my Yale College and my Harvard.